Assalamu alaikum fam. Hope you're doing well. We're continuing our reading of the Federalist Papers. Fantastic work by the founders, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, John Jay. Truly, reading such essays of the 17th century really help us to truly understand what was the goal of the Founding Fathers. And to be quite honest, a lot of people who talk trash about the Founding Fathers have not actually read their works, but simply focus on their sexual orientation, their skin color, and the fact that they own slaves. So they reduce their brilliant work down to just these three points, which is not charitable, intelligent, and not very a fair shake. All right? People on death row, I'd argue, are worse than what the founders did. And if you study their biographies, their writings, you get to see their brilliance of it and why the new communists today and the new socialists today hate them. Because once they can get you to hate the founders who emphasize, you know, liberty from an oppressive federal government and communism is an oppressive government, you begin to see the patterns of why they'd want you to hate what is good for you. Okay? So, we are continuing. We're on page 122. And it was essay number 26 titled, The Idea of Restraining the Legislative Authority in Regard to the Common Defense Considered, Alexander Hamilton. And that is a great title to an essay. So let's begin. As you know, I study political science. And like I said, you cannot criticize the Founding Fathers if you have not read anything that they've done, right? your woke school and what your talking points of your university professor said it's not enough to really say you know their stances. The attempts of the two states to restrict the authority of the legislature in the article of military establishments are of the number of these instances the principles which had taught us to be jealous of the power of an hereditary monarch. So notice, taught us to be jealous of the power of an hereditary monarch. So to really look at the power that is bestowed onto a monarch and say like, you know, that is quite substantial. We want something different here, right? So you have the absolute power in a monarch, absolute power in a dic communist dictator. Founders don't want that crap here were by an injudicious success extended to the representatives of the people in their popular assemblies. Even in some of the states where this error was not adopted, we find unnecessary declarations that standing armies ought not to be kept up in time of peace without the consent of the legislator. Okay, so notice this. So there's a stance where you need the consent of the legislator if you want a standing army to be present in times of peace where there's not an active war going on, right? So that is something to consider, something to consider. I call them unnecessary because the reason which had introduced a similar provision into the English Bill of Rights, English Bill of Rights, is not applicable to any of the state constitutions the power of raising armies at all under those constitutions can by no construction be deemed to reside anywhere else than in the legislatures themselves. And it was superfluous, if not absurd, to declare that a matter should not be done without the consent of a body, which alone had the power of doing it. So notice this, the consent of a body instead of the consent of a monarch or dictator. Right. Accordingly, in some of those constitutions, and among others, in that of the state of New York, which has justly celebrated both in Europe and America as one of the best of the forms of government established in this country, there is a total silence upon the subject. It is remarkable that even in the two states which seem to have meditated and interdiction of military establishments in times of peace, the mode of expression made use of its rather minority than prohibitory. So notice this. 
made use rather monetary than prohibitory. He's such a master with words. It's quite brilliant. It is not said that standing armies shall not be kept up, but that they ought not to be kept up in time of peace. Very interesting language here. So shall not versus ought not. Very interesting concept to look at the semantics of language. Because when it comes to legislation and someone's going to interpret it, that type of nuance matters. Centrally so. Because ought not means there's room for potentiality, whereas shall not means no. Right? This ambiguity of terms appears to have been the result of a conflict between jealousy and conviction, between the desire of excluding such establishments at all events and the persuasion that an absolute exclusion would be unwise and unsafe. So notice this, the persuasion that an absolute exclusion would be unwise and unsafe. So what is he saying is that there actually might be a time where it would be wiser and safer to fund a military in times of peace. For example, you may not have a country invading you at that time, but you might have a particular faction that is starting to bubble up and cause problems. And you might want to call in your military in order to utilize a sense of force to suppress that faction, right? That is starting to rise up and cause problems. So there's a lot of wisdom in what he's saying here. Can it be doubted that such a provision, whenever the situation of public affairs was understood to require a departure from it, would be interpreted by the legislator into a mere admonition so mere admonition and would be made to yield to the necessities or supposed necessities of the state so to yield to supposed or actual necessary needs of the state very interesting right so mere admonition as in warning or really defined necessity you see that let the fact already mentioned with respect to Pennsylvania decide what then it may be asked is the use of such a provision if it ceases to operate the moment there is an inclination to disregard it that's a very interesting question so if there's a provision like that and it doesn't operate what's the inclination to use it and then how easy it is to disregard it because if it's just a mere admonition you can disregard it you follow let us examine whether be any comparison and point of efficacy between the provision allude and to that which is contained in the new constitution. Now notice how he said provision alluded to, right? The appropriations of money for military purposes to the period of two years. So remember how there was a caveat where if they were going to have a army in times of peace then it would be in a two-year process right so you'd have funding for two years the former but Amy at too much is calculated to affect nothing the latter by steering clear of an imprudent extreme imprudent extreme and by being perfectly compatible with a proper provision for the exigencies of the nation will have a salutary and powerful operation the legislature of the United States will be obliged by this provision once at least in every two years to deliberate upon the propriety of keeping a military force on foot, to come to a new resolution on the point and to declare their sense of the matter by a formal vote in the face of their constituents. They are not at liberty to vest in the executive department permanent funds for the support of an army. So that's a very interesting way to phrase it. They're not at liberty to have permanent funds to go and you know deal with an army who's going to constantly stand in times of peace it's very interesting if they were even and not cautious enough to be willing to repose in it so improper a confidence so improper a confidence he says 
at the spirit of party in different degrees must be expected to win effect all political bodies. There will be no doubt persons in the national legislature willing enough to arrive in the measures incriminate the views of the majority. The provision, the support of a military force will always be favorable topic for declamation. As often as the question comes forward, the public attention will be roused and attracted to the subject by the party in opposition. And if the majority should be really disposed to exceed their proper limits, the community will be warned of the danger and will have the opportunity of taking measures to guard against it exactly. So, yes, a favorable target for declamation. So the public attention is going to be awakened to show that there is something going on here. There's a warning of a danger and that they'll be able to guard against it. So I was on the right track with that, mashallah. Independent of parties in the national legislature itself, as often as the period of discussion arrived, the state legislatures, who will always be not only vigilant but suspicious and jealous guardians of the rights of the citizens against encroachments from the federal government. Now look at that. Look at that. Do you see what he just said, this brilliant man? The state legislators have to be vigilant and suspicious and jealous guardians for making sure that the rights of the citizens are not being encroached upon by the federal government. Do you see the difference here with how Alexander Hamilton views the federal government? That they should not encroach upon you, taking away your gun rights, taking away your speech rights, taking away your freedom to assemble, slowly, you know, allowing the NSA to spy on you. All these things that progressives and others, Republicans too, pretty much both of the parties have forgotten the Founding Fathers and their mission. And many universities are teaching you to hate Alexander Hamilton. But look at what he's saying. Look at what he's saying. They get you to read Marx. They get you to want to vote in soft communism with Bernie Sanders and Andrew Yang with his UBI. But look, he's saying that the state legislature should actually be jealous guardians for the rights of the citizens, not submissively obeying lobbyists, foreign interests, super PAC money, the private corporate industry, the globalists, right? To not only submit to whatever the Beijing Biden administration declares or what social media wants, right? Not what the woke cancel culture mob wants, but to stick to the rights of the citizens this is very powerful. Not just the rights of Team Blue and suppressing Team Red. All of the people. But now you see that the soft communists, hurrahing censorship for their opponents, putting their journalists to freak the population out and beg for their rights to solely be encroached upon by the federal government in the name of misinformation, right? powerful statement there because that shows you that the job is to serve the people not the people being serfs feudalistic slaves to the state to not be enslaved to the state the politicians working for us not locking us down them flying on planes relaxing leeching off our tax dollars getting fat and their comfortable offices no guard our rights we have rights do your job. Be jealous guardians includes a sort of love. Love for the people. Because if you love something, you'll jealously guard it, right? Jealousy includes a sort of endearment to the people. So the union being reflected by the legislature guarding jealously the rights of the people and keeping the federal government in check, right? Not allowing the federal government to stomp on all the state's rights that is very important it's extremely important so it's it's just brilliant we'll constantly have their attention awake so look at this constantly have their attention awake vigilant suspicious alexander hamilton is telling you to be suspicious of the federal government 
What do Facebook and the liberal progressives say? Believe whatever CNN tells you. Believe whatever Facebook tells you. Believe whatever left-wing Twitterati tells you. Believe everything that Psaksky, the speaker, the press secretary of Biden, Beijing Biden says. Trust us. Trust us. We are your friends. Trust us. No. You see, this is a big reason why the Marxists and the really woke mob have neglected their duty of studying and educating their students and instead radicalized them in favor of Mao, Lenin, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, Karl Marx, Engels, and then turned completely against the founders simply over slavery, them being white and being straight, not being gay or bisexual. This is the power of propaganda to get you to hate the very same people who are saying such wonderful, practical things that will benefit everyone. It really shows you the corruption of our nation's education system and how we have to go back to it and how there is a huge danger of the left wing censoring everyone who tries to educate people on the truth of the founders but instead gets you to worry and, and pull your hair out over the slavery issue. Which, if you're going to do that with every country in the world, it's going to take a while. And that has no effect upon the principles that he has chosen for our rights. Yes, you can say it was hypocritical at that time because slavery was still around. But that doesn't mean that we throw the baby out with the bathwater in today's world and trust globalist communists and their regimes and to not hold our own government accountable. It shows you that he had an almost idealistic sense of what he wanted those people to be like, right? To the conduct of the national rulers and will be ready enough if anything improper appears to sound the alarm to the people and not only by the voice but if necessary the arm of their discontent. So do you see that? So not just the voice, but the arm of their discontent and be ready and to sound the alarm for the people, to tell the people directly that the federal government is encroaching upon their rights. Brilliant. Alexander Hamilton was a brilliant person. Again, reading their works for yourself instead of believing critical race theory and the, the very woke anti-capitalist colonizer mob when you read it for yourself when you actually sit down you realize that there's more to Alexander than what the mob tells you as they really glorify communism and ignore what Stalin and other countries did really shows how the study of economics and ethics and systems of government have been polluted entirely and that's why I'd argue every political scientist should read the Federalist Papers for themselves before they slam the Founding Fathers. And if you hear someone slamming the Founding Fathers, ask them, have you actually read anything at all that they wrote? Have you read any of their biographies, any of their essays? And if the person says no, take their opinions about the Founders and toss them in the trash because you cannot speak about what you don't know and what you have not studied, right? A wise person does not speak about what they have not studied for themselves, right? Brilliant.